slight concentrations of cadmium and arsenic in these cannons, but luckily it's getting less and the muscularity is not getting any less because of it. Vigor Steve here with my EDTA chelation therapy blood work results. And I'm very sorry it took so long, guys, but it took the lab about three to four weeks before I got both blood work results back because, I, of course, I did my blood work before this EDTA chelation therapy while I was fasting for six and a half days and afterwards to see the difference, right? How much of a change an EDTA chelation protocol would make on my heavy metal blood work parameters. So now I've got both results back. And then I got a little bit sidetracked with a little bit of a holiday. So six weeks uh, after the fact, we're finally here. We're going to review it and give you guys a little bit of a backstory why I did this particular protocol. Now, if you're not familiar with what I did with this fast previously and how it changed my blood work parameters regarding my complete blood count, my lipids, my liver enzymes, and my hormone panel, I would highly suggest you to watch the previous video, which I recorded over a month ago. So if you haven't watched that video yet, you can watch it right here. It will bring you up to speed on how that fast went from a fat loss perspective and how my blood work parameters changed compared to previous fasts. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm and consider subscribing if you haven't already. EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. There are several different forms of EDTA chelation therapy available, but the most commonly used is calcium disodium EDTA. And when calcium disodium EDTA comes into contact with heavy metals, it donates its calcium atom and absorbs the heavy metal, binding it and marking it for excretion. So it binds with lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, or aluminium, which are generally uh, unwanted in the body in higher concentrations, but it doesn't discriminate between metals or minerals. So it can also remove zinc, magnesium, copper, or iron, for example. So it's very important to supplement with particular minerals that calcium disodium EDTA also excretes from the body, either during or after EDTA chelation therapy, to prevent a micronutrient or a mineral deficiency while trying to right, excrete the lead, the mercury, the cadmium, arsenic, or aluminium from the body. So when these heavy metals are encapsulated or bound to EDTA, they're excreted through the kidneys in a similar way how to calcium deglucrate, optimizes the glucuronidation process and helps excrete metabolic waste products and toxins through the kidneys, which I ran concurrently during this six and a half day fasting protocol. Now keep in mind, right, that it doesn't discriminate. So I tested all of these blood work parameters before and after to make sure that I did not induce some sort of mineral deficiency by doing an extensive um, EDTA chelation therapy over the course of six and a half days in combination with calcium deglucrate. We'll get into those before and after blood work results a little bit later in this video. Now, in medical treatments, where calcium disodium EDTA chelation therapy is used to treat heavy metal poisoning, it's always administered through an IV administration, where the calcium disodium EDTA is diluted and administered over a course of two to three hours. This prevents side effects like nausea or arterial agitation when administering these kinds of compounds through an IV administration. And it also subjects your body to this di calcium disodium EDTA over a prolonged period of time, improving chelation of the heavy metals, allowing more lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, or aluminium to be excreted from the body through the kidneys. And another important reason why IV administrations are preferred over oral administrations of EDTA is because oral EDTA is generally not very well absorbed, minimizing the amount of EDTA and actual chelation which occurs when taking calcium disodium EDTA in an oral tablet form. Unless you're fasting. When you're fasting, calcium disodium EDTA seems to be much better absorbed than when you're taking this while eating food throughout the day. So this is one of the reasons why I only do calcium disodium EDTA chelation therapy while I'm fasting, even though now I have uh, accessibility to IV EDTA therapy, which I might do in the future on another fast, if I want to detoxify more heavy metals from my body, which most of my markers are already quite low, as you'll see from the blood work results. 
But for most people that don't have access to IV EDTA therapy, if you want to do oral EDTA supplementation, you'll have to do that while fasting. And whether that's one day, four days, six days, however long you can stomach fasting, pun intended, that's the best time to administer oral calcium disodium EDTA. Now, there's a multitude of reasons why anybody into health and fitness, especially bodybuilders, especially bodybuilders, guys, you need to do EDTA chelation therapy quite frequently, maybe every six months, at least once per year. But if you're into general health and fitness, it's also important to check your heavy metal markers at least once a year to see if they're not building up over time. Because if you follow a repetitive diet, especially a pescatarian diet containing a lot of white fish, lead mercury right, might slowly build up in your body and accumulate in the fat tissue or in other tissues of the body, leading to heavy metal toxicity down the line. So if you're following a pescatarian diet like I do, it's important to check your heavy metals at least once per year, just to make sure you're not accumulating heavy metals over time and can address these issues before you get into heavy metal toxicity and all the terrible symptoms which come along with that. I'll put them on the screen so you guys can uh, take some notes in case you're suffering from some of these symptoms yourself. Then you definitely need to go in for blood work to assess if you have um, particular heavy metals way out of the reference range. And there's a little bit of an overlapping effect with side effects caused by performance enhancing drugs. So it's a little bit hard to pinpoint sometimes through self-diagnosis at home. And that's why we have blood work to help you diagnose yourself properly. So I did this heavy metal screening pretty much every year or every 18 months because I was following a pescatarian diet. But all of my previous blood work results always came back good. I think one of the reasons is that even though I follow a pescatarian diet with a lot of white fish and salmon, and I eat that on a daily basis, all of my food is imported and wild caught. And I always make sure that I spend the extra money not to get farm raised and make sure that I limit myself to fish um, that are not known to contain lead or mercury. So it doesn't accumulate and build up over time within every blood work screening that I do. But still, right, if you eat a pescatarian diet on a day-to-day -day basis and you're eating a ton of fish, especially if you're doing a bodybuilding contest and your, your, your diet is basically all white fish, Stay on top of that because, again, it might build up over time. And if you're not uh, keeping track of your heavy metal concentrations in the bloodstream, then, well, side effects might manifest later down the line, as we've seen with Dominic Cardone, who was eating a ton of white fish and always went out for a sushi a dinner buffet, sort of say, and then got heavy metal poisoning um, because his diet was pretty much pescatarian. And, yeah, that's a, a situation that you might find yourself in unless you're really focusing on wild-caught fish and avoiding the fish which are known to contain higher levels of lead or mercury or other heavy metals. I've also been avoiding underground lab gear. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize. Like besides the synthetic carrier oils that some of the underground labs use, uh, causing a tremendous amount of systemic inflammation, which you should definitely avoid. Right? So the, the short list of approved carrier oils, MCT, sesame, olive oil, cottonseed, grapeseed, and castor oil. And if it's not one of these six, or it contains a little bit of ethyl oleate, avoid it. But underground labs come with another hidden issue, is that some of the poorly produced raws might contain heavy metals as well. Because when raws are produced in China or India, some of the manufacturers, they don't follow good manufacturing practices or the United States Standard Pharmacopoeia guidelines. Meaning that when those rods are produced in whatever machinery they use, maybe a lot of lead, mercury, arsenic, or other heavy metals end up in the raw. And even if the underground lab has the best setup possible to make sterile and accurately dosed uh, products with the right carrier oils that don't cause systemic inflammation, the raw, even though it's 100% pure, might still contain heavy metals. And now you're injecting that directly into the body. So besides the, the carrier oils that might be problematic, heavy metal contaminants is also a problem of underground labs. And it's not something you'll see with pharmaceuticals because they are following good manufacturing practices and follow United States Standard Pharmacopoeia guidelines. So there's no heavy metal contaminants within your Bayer or Rotex Medica or Organon or Aspen or whatever else 
whatever other pharmaceutical products um, you're intending to use. Right? So if you're into health and fitness and you follow this repetitive lifestyle of underground labs and um, cheap white fish, you definitely need to check your heavy metal concentrations and, and maybe have a calcium disodium EDTA just stocked up in your supplement closet just in case you get those blood work results back and they're all way high, uh, way too high for comfort. You stop eating, you start your EDTA chelation therapy, and then within a week, your levels should come down significantly. So that's what I did. I did six and a half days of fasting, spacing out 600 milligrams calcium disodium EDTA over four serving of the day, alongside 500 milligrams calcium deglucurate, taken at eight o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon, and eight o'clock in the evening. So that brings a total to 2,000 milligrams of calcium deglucurate and 2,000 milligrams of calcium disodium EDTA for a period of six days in total. I briefly want to discuss my hormone levels because during this fast, I was taking 2,000 milligrams of calcium deglucurate, which donates glucuronidite in the glucuronidation process when sex hormones like estradiol, dihydrotestosterone, which I didn't test, uh, testosterone, progesterone, DHEA, they all undergo glucuronidation, and when that process is optimized, serum concentrations might come down slightly. As you can see from my blood work, I did not change anything to my uh, performance-enhancing drug protocol. So my estradiol came down with about 7% from 40.3 to 37.5 picograms per milliliter. Progesterone was undetectable below 0.1, so that didn't really change because, again, the levels were undetectable in both the before and after blood work results. Total testosterone came down with 2.8% from 1131 to about 1100. DHA sulfate actually increased during this time, but keep in mind this is not free DHA. This is DHA sulfate, which is basically a metabolically inert version of DHA. DHA sulfate is sulfated through the sulfotransferase enzymes, allowing it to strongly bind to albumin and transport through the bloodstream that way. And when it's metabolized back into DHEA, it can actually convert into sex hormones or potentiate some of, its, some of its effects through the androgen receptor. So during this experiment, DHEA sulfate went up with 3.7% from 351 to 364 micrograms per deciliter. Could just be a moment in time, could be an increased effect of the ACG I was running while fasting, and a multitude of reasons why DHEA sulfate might have gone up. But as you can see from these blood work results, there is not a tremendous negative effect of running 2,000 milligrams calcium deglucurate on your sex hormone or neurosteroid panel for this short window of time that was, well, six and a half days. And what did noticeably change were my ferritin and serum iron levels. And six weeks ago, when I did my before and after blood work results of this fast, while I was waiting for the heavy metal results, I did not really understand why my ferritin and serum iron levels went up. So I've done a lot of research since then. And my ferritin went up with 43.4% from 122 to 175 nanograms per milliliter. And my serum iron went up with 83.1% from 71 to 130 micrograms per deciliter. Now, that's the first time I actually saw my ferritin and serum iron levels go up while fasting. Right? But in previous fasts, I would always incorporate some sort of pharmacology or tutka or, or fiber supplements or anything else to expel um, toxins from the body. And the supplemental calcium disodium EDTA or the calcium deglucurate for that matter might have a contributing role in increasing levels of ferritin and serum iron in the bloodstream over the duration of the six and a half day fast. Because EDTA in blood tests is the preferred and recommended anticoagulant of choice because EDTA itself allows for the best preservation of cellular components and the morphology of blood cells when blood is removed from the body. And this is why some of the, the blood tubes have different caps in different colors, whether it's red or blue or purple, because some of them contain EDTA while others do not. So it could be that that has something to do with it, um, raising my serum iron concentrations besides the EDTA that was taken in supplemental form, the EDTA which is contained within the test tubes. And then again, there's a lot of variables in this picture. So it could be parts uh, increased detoxification of the liver, raising ferritin and serum iron concentrations in the bloodstream. 
It could be red blood cell metabolism, which is very common while fasting. You'll see that your red blood cell count in hematocrit drops with a couple points. And as the red blood cells, the aged ones, undergo autophagy, they release our hemoglobin, which is then metabolized into bilirubin in the liver, which in my previous blood work results did not change so much. And as this bilirubin is metabolized in the liver, it releases a little bit of iron, which causes ferritin to go up, because ferritin, after all, is a transporting protein for iron. So as, as iron levels in the liver go up, ferritin is increased to transport iron to other tissues of the body. And because I excluded tetka and fiber, right, whether that's fiber supplements or vegetables in this six and a half day fast, I'm sure some of the conjugated bilirubin and the, the iron, which is detoxified into the intestinal tract, got reabsorbed in the enterohepatic recirculation of bile acids, allowing serum iron levels and ferritin levels to come up in this fast. Because again, I changed some things to my protocol. I did not include any fiber, no tutka, and included the EDTA, um, which all could have had an effect and explain why my ferritin went up with 43% and my serum iron went up with 83%. I'll recheck these markers a couple of weeks from now when I intend to fast again, and I may make some modifications to this protocol and perhaps do intravenous EDTA chelation therapy to see if that has a different effect on these blood work parameters. Let's move over to the electrolytes. I already discussed them in a previous fasting video, so I'll just discuss them briefly here. Sodium went down with 3.5% from 141 to 136 milliequivalent per liter. Potassium went down with 17%. From 5.3 to 4.4 milliequivalent per liter. Chloride went down 4% from 100 to 96 milliequivalent per liter. Total carbon dioxide went up with 3.7% from 27 to 28 milliequivalent per liter. Calcium went down with 1.1% from 9.1 to 9 milligrams per deciliter. And magnesium went down a whopping 13.6% from 2.2 to 1.9 milligrams per deciliter. Now, keep in mind that I stopped all supplements, all food intake of these electrolytes when I did this fast, so there was no supplemental calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium in place. That's why I feel that the potassium and the magnesium dropped so much. And keep in mind, I think that the calcium barely changed because calcium desodium EDTA and calcium deglucurate both contained calcium, so technically I was still supplementing with calcium. I'm not exactly sure how much calcium both supplements contain, but judging by the reduction of 1.1%, and again, keep in mind that the body is very efficient in regulating serum calcium levels, right, because it's used to control blood pressure as one of the effects of calcium in the bloodstream and acidity levels of the bloodstream. So even though potassium and magnesium went down significantly because my potassium intake was maybe 8,000 milligrams per day and my magnesium intake was 2,000 milligrams per day coming from food and magnesium bisglycinate supplementation. But I feel because the intake was so high before I started this fast and the inclusion of um, right, detoxification aids, um, they came down quite significant. And again, keep in mind that calcium disodium EDTA does not discriminate between electrolyte minerals and heavy metals. So supplementing with that, you can kind of expect um, some of these markers to come down quite significantly. I also checked my zinc and copper levels because I was supplementing with 25 milligrams zinc picolinate and 10 milligrams GHK copper before I started this EDTA chelation therapy protocol. And keep in mind that in the medical treatments of EDTA chelation to treat heavy metal poisoning, Zinc deficiency is actually quite common with prolonged EDTA exposure. So when the heavy metals are very, very high, you need to do these IV administrations for a prolonged period of time. Since EDTA doesn't discriminate, it will start removing the zinc from the body as well. So zinc deficiency is actually quite common in these medical treatments. That's why generally zinc supplements are prescribed concurrently with IV administrations of calcium disodium EDTA. So I checked my levels before. Again, I was running 25 milligram zinc picolinate, which I discontinued that week while I was doing the chelation therapy. And I was using 10 milligrams GHK copper five times per week post-workout, containing 18.7% copper. So that's basically, right, through some fancy calculation, 
I was supplementing with 1.34 milligrams copper per day. So that's a very small intake of copper when you look at it that way, which I also discontinued during this week of EDTA chelation therapy. So zinc went down with 30% from 1.2, which is slightly over the reference range, down to 0.84 micrograms per milliliter. And copper levels went down with 20.8% from 1.3 to 1.03 micrograms per milliliter. So I discontinued the supplements and I added in the EDTA, a mean average of 25% reduction in the zinc and copper levels, that's quite significant. But when we look at the metals, the actual heavy metals that I wanted to detoxify, uh, the results are kind of all over the place. So let's start with cadmium. The first time I tested cadmium, it was undetectable, below 0.1 micrograms per liter. And ideally, you want to keep that below 5 micrograms per liter. So I'm far below, right at the first blood work results, I was far below toxicity levels. Then after the EDTA treatment, my cadmium levels went up to 0.5 micrograms per liter. So let's assume they were barely undetectable at 0.1 micrograms per liter, and they went up to 0.5 micrograms per liter. That's an increase of 500%. Cadmium levels with EDTA chelation therapy went up at least 500%, maybe even more. And I think that can be explained in a similar fashion to how my serum iron levels increased on this particular fast with EDTA chelation therapy in place. The surrounding tissue detoxified the cadmium into the bloodstream. The calcium disodium EDTA bound the cadmium, marking it for excretion through the kidneys. But because a lot of detoxification was occurring, maybe this cadmium did not get excreted to an extent as we see with the lead, mercury, aluminium, or arsenic. And so there might be a little bit of recirculation present or an increased detoxification of the tissue into the bloodstream and keeping the cadmium there. So if I were to check these cadmium levels again, I'm sure it would come down to below 0.1 again. But it could be a reduction in detoxification or a a prolonged effect of detoxification of this cadmium specifically. Again, I'm not exactly sure what the relative binding affinities are of cadmium, lead, mercury, iron, aluminium, arsenic to calcium disodium EDTA or disodium EDTA after the calcium atom has been removed along for chelation. I'm not exactly sure what the relative binding affinities are and how each individual heavy metal gets excreted through the kidneys after it's been bound. And that data I could not pinpoint. So maybe it takes longer for cadmium to be excreted and arsenic gets excreted relatively easily, right? Speculating a little bit, I really tried to dig into the research, but I can't find anything that could pinpoint why cadmium levels or serum iron levels went up. They're doing a little bit of a dubious speculation here and why mercury, aluminum, and arsenic levels went down or zinc and copper levels went down so much. When I went in for my blood work screening after this experiment concluded on October 17th, I saw that they already had the results of my lead marker, which I did before this experiment started. And there it showed that it was below 2.0 micrograms per deciliter, which was exactly the same, right? Undetectable lead concentrations in my bloodstream, similar to all of the other heavy metal screenings that I've done in the past. So I decided not to retest my lead markers because well every marker costs money and every marker takes time to get back so when i saw well lead is undetectable i decided not to retest these markers which now looking back at my cadmium levels increasing with maybe over 500 percent right still uh, far below the toxicity levels but still increasing nonetheless uh, on these results i kind of re regret that because maybe my lead markers would have increased as well so that's uh, my bad, my sincere apologies, guys. Again, it's my lead marker has always been undetectable below 2.0 micrograms per deciliter. And ideally, you keep that below 20 micrograms per deciliter. Mercury came down with 14.3% from 0 0.7 to 0 0.6 micrograms per deciliter. They would consider you not to be exposed to mercury below 2 micrograms per deciliter. And above that up until 4 micrograms per deciliter, they would consider you to be exposed. And then over 4 micrograms per deciliter would be mercury toxicity. 
So that's a significant reduction in mercury, even though right, it only went down with 0.1 micrograms per deciliter, it's still 14.3%. Aluminium came down significantly with 64.7% from 1.7 to 0.6 micrograms per deciliter. Ideally, you keep that below 6 micrograms per deciliter, so on the initial results, I was far below toxicity for aluminium. And my arsenic came down with 42.4% from 4.62 to 2.66 micrograms per liter. Again, you keep that below 12 micrograms per liter, after which arsenic uh, poisoning might be problematic. So all of these markers, very comparable to previous results when I did my heavy metal screening a couple of years back. Hopefully I can get these levels down a little bit more with additional EDTA chelation therapy through IV administrations, which I'll probably schedule at the end of the year, maybe between Christmas and New Year's or after New Year's. And then well, I will probably still take a couple of weeks before I get those results back. So um, stay tuned for that, right? I like to do the blood work before and after. So when I finally have those results in, I will inform you guys of uh, what has changed and what has improved between oral calcium disodium EDTA chelation therapy and intravenous calcium disodium EDTA chelation therapy. So even though I did a pretty aggressive fasting protocol without any additional supplementation, right, to keep a particular electrolytes or minerals present while doing this extensive EDTA chelation therapy for a whole week, I did not drop serum concentrations below their reference ranges, but I think if I were to continue doing this EDTA chelation therapy, I will make sure to keep the sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, zinc, and copper in place to prevent those levels from declining unnecessarily, so to say. So I'm trying to remove all of these heavy metals from my body over several EDTA trials, right? Again, from these before results and all of the results that I've gotten in the past, I don't see a reason for alarm. Still, it's a fun experiment to run and right, the lower my cadmium, lead, mercury, aluminum or arsenic levels are, um, the healthier I look on paper. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the ebooks on my website, vigorsteve.com slash shop. If you're looking for personalized advice regarding your own blood work parameters and perhaps like to design an EDTA chelation therapy protocol for yourself, I'm always available for consultations. You can find the rates in the consultations section. Follow me on Instagram at Vigor Steve and might as well follow me on TikTok as well at Vigor Steve. Also, have a look at my link tree with discount codes for all the sponsors and affiliates that I'm associated with, companies that I believe in and purchase products from myself. Use those discount codes to save yourself some money in the process. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. A front double bicep for you guys. Slight concentrations of cadmium and arsenic in these cannons. But luckily it's getting less and the muscularity is not getting any less because of it. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.